Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Weekly Armchair Sports Talk podcast. This is United Pod. This is Devil's Advocate, joined by the great Brian Murphy from Stretty News today. Here today is obviously chat another day out in Wembley, um, Manchester United versus Brighton in the FA Cup semi final. We're going to uh, reflect briefly on Seville. I don't think many of us want to talk too much about it after um, the, the bad result we had the other day. We'll, look, we'll touch on it briefly. We're also going to touch on the former Jaden Sancho and what potentially his future could be at Manchester United. And also, we're going to talk about Eric Ten Hag's options, I suppose, very slim options at the back tomorrow and what we may think um, Eric Ten Hag, with how we'd approach the game tomorrow. So, look, do get your questions in, guys, and, and don't forget to share the video as well. Um, Brian, I suppose it was a rough enough game the other night. Like, look, like we always know. Sevilla always gives a tough game, regardless of form or competition or whatever. They seem to always turn up when it when it's against United. Um, you're out in Seville, and um, what are your thoughts on the performance and kind of you know what were your takeaways from it? Um, I suppose going out to, to Seville for the game, I think like a lot of Reds, we were up, we were half apprehensive about what was going to happen after the first leg, um, the first half of the first leg. We we absolutely destroyed them in the first forty five minutes. Come half time, yeah. and like we were looking and going, Jesus, if this could be this could be a cricket score. They're not up to much. We could put away a few more chances. This game is dead and buried. Um, we didn't. We had one probably massive chance where Veghorst could have pulled it back to one or two other players apart from Malasia. Um, poor decision making. We go up three 0 Ties dead and buried. Didn't happen. We committed defensive suicide. Brought him back into it after Tin Hag's questionable triple sub. Um, and we go to Seville needing to, to perform with a weakened squad and up against the Seville side or Sevilla side side that they're Europa League specialists. We have ne- we've never beaten them, I don't believe, in, in European competition. Um, and again, through the form, the last six seasons we've been knocked out of Europe by a Spanish side and it remains intact. Um, dog, a dog shit performance out in Seville. Very lethargic players like statues around the place, very little effort put in, very little urgency. Even when we conceded, there was no urgency whatsoever seen across the pitch. Um, a few individual performances that should be raising some major red flags for Ten Hag. Um, it just wasn't good enough, Keen. It just, it just simply wasn't anywhere near good enough. Any, any football fan, as much as we don't like getting beat, you can stomach getting beat if you've seen your side put in the effort and, and fight hard and, and go dogged. But they just rolled over like a fucking like a sack of spuds. It was it was pathetic, toothless, spineless performance, which is just simply isn't good enough. Yeah, look, I think we've seen a couple of times this season. I think in big away games, we've we've had a couple of um, I suppose questionable performances, and I think look, Seville was one of them. I think look, like you said, I think they were lethargic. I think their energy definitely wasn't there. And I know we're going to touch on like squad depth and mental and physical fatigue and, and things like that. But I think that, like when you look, when you look at certain players performances, it's been kind of the same old we've seen from some of maybe our fringe players have come in. You've seen the likes Harry Maguire who struggled, Lindelof struggled. Um, you know, we've talked about the goalkeeper situation like off air before. Um, but like, it seemed like there was, a lot of players putting in fours and fives rather than sevens and eights, you know, really. And I think that's that was a massive problem the other night. The whole, like the whole issue started from the back. I mean, in modern football, you build. Even though I'm not a massive fan of this playing out from the back and going back to the keeper crack, I'm not a big fan of it. I, it go, when it goes wrong, it costs you dearly. But it's what it's what the top sides seem to play these days. And when we're playing with Martinez, Varane, who are within reason press resistant or at least are a hell of a lot more adept at, at handling a press coming at them you go back to to Lindelof and Maguire you're back to Van Gaal days again of, of very 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 slow build up play uh, it's Maguire to, to Lindelof to Maguire to Lindelof to Maguire to Lindelof you're standing in this, inside in the stand just going Jesus fuck me pass it to anybody but the two of you back to the gay again who do you put the blame on for that one? 50 50. I don't know. Some will go to Gay, some will go to Maguire. Doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it all stems from the fact that we can't play out from the back with Maguire and Lindelof on the side. Um, it highlights the fact that the drop off in quality, which is true throughout the pitch, from our starting 11, which to be fair, our strongest starting 11 is a very decent side. Yeah. And not very decent, but it's, just, it's, it's, it put Barcelona to the sword quite easily, you know. It's it's not a bad side at all, Tal, but when you start dropping off with injuries and suspensions, what's coming in behind them is nowhere near what we what we 
go forward. I mean, the standards that we're aiming for and, and the highs we're aiming for, if we want to catch the likes of Arsenal and City in the league, you need to up your game completely. Like We need to have that starting eleven or at least something at the same level throughout the season. You can't be dropping off from, from a, a title-challenging type side back to a mid-table type side again just because you've lost a few players. The, the depth isn't there to, to allow that for us. So, um, yeah, it killed us at the back. It killed us. We Every time we came out, Maguire got the ball. and uh, Maguire was funny the last night because I've seen Harry Maguire play games where he receives the ball from De Gea and he'll play these semi-decent diagonal balls out to the likes of Rashford on the wing or he'll find a half-decent pass and he's more attacking-minded as such. The last night, he just looked like absolutely petrified to pass it anywhere bar left and right. He just wouldn't, he wouldn't burst out of the fence. He wouldn't try and spray a ball wide. Is it nerves? Is it fear? Is it the fact that everyone's on his case? I don't know. I, like, we, we all know he's not good enough. That's, that's not debatable. Yeah, that's good to see, yeah. Yeah, he's, it's not good. He's not good enough. It's simple. It's not, he's, not, he's not the player to take us forward. Um, I think Tin Hag has dealt with that situation very well. He's, he's allowed Maguire to leave the side without causing many waves. And to be fair, to give credit to Maguire, barring a couple of self-ego type comments, he hasn't really caused any waves. You know, He hasn't gone to the agent and he hasn't gone to the front page of the paper and acted like a dickhead or screaming transfer requests. Or, you know, so you give, give the fellow credit for that, but he knows he's not good enough. He knows he's not up to the level that we want. Um, and it showed. It showed massively. Um, he just... Do you, he think, was, do you think he's suffering from like a... Because we've seen on occasion, like especially if you look in the, his first season under Solskjaer and even the second season when we finished second, he was you know, quite a good defender. Do you think he's like since kind of the turn of the Euros since then that he's just suffering from a massive crisis of confidence? He, do you think, do you know, maybe the stature of playing for a club of Manchester United may be too big for him? And that's okay, like, you know, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, like he, he looks like he's absolutely shell shocked with the whole thing. He just. I, I was, I, I was being honest. I never wanted him. I never wanted us yeah. to sign. I thought the transfer fee was ludicrous. I wasn't sure he was that good. I knew he was a half decent defender, but was he the man for us? Probably not. I did not. Well, definitely not. No, but um, he came in with a big price tag. English international. You'd be forgiven for giving a centre half English international massive price tag the captaincy. Um, so I don't really hold any grudges on that. It just didn't work out. The job was too big for him. The role was too big for him. The captaincy became too big for him. And he's not, he's just not good enough. He needs, he needs to go to Italy, if I'm honest. He needs to do it. He needs to replicate what Smalling has achieved over there. Go to a game where it's slower football. The media aren't as up your arse as they are over in England. The fans are probably going to be a slight bit more accepting because he doesn't, he's not going to be relying on his pace as much as he has to try and do for us. Um, I just think he'd have a better, a better end of his career if he just took off into the sun. And Smalling's done it. I can't see why Maguire can't, but he's not. He's not for us. No. No, I think. Look, especially if you look at Eric Ten Hag next season. Like I know Julio's mentioning there in the comments, us wanting to play progressive football. I think. Look, Harry Maguire would have very di- a very difficult time playing a high line, especially look if you counteract that as well with a goalkeeper that doesn't come out. Yeah. Um, you know, doesn't sweep behind you. It makes that job even harder for well, both goalkeeper and um, centre half. So like, look, it's a very bad mix. And look, if I be honest. When you look at other teams, like the type of centre half, they always have kind of the same type of profile of player. When you look at Man City, like I hate comparing to City, but if you look at like when Ruben Diaz comes outside, John Stones can jump in there, or Kanji can jump in there, and there's the same style of play. They can play the same style of play, and there's no adjustment that needs to be made. Whereas when Maguire comes into the team, you see the automatic drop off, and then you see look, he can't play to this system's strengths because no. he doesn't have the skill set to do. And I think that's it's become evident. And I think look. Again, like, look, he hasn't thrown drops. He hasn't gone to Piers Morgan or anything like that. But I do, do think if Eric Ten Hag is to succeed at this football club, I think this summer especially there's going to be massive decisions he's going to have to make in certain areas of the pitch. I think Harry Maguire is, like, at tip top of that list in terms of you know, getting, him off, getting him off the wage bill because even with new ownership that potentially could come in, Brian, we know financial fair play issues are going to take effect this summer and um, because of the way this club has been mishandled by the Glazers. So... Like, look, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of big decisions that are going to be made, and Eric Ten Hag has a big job in his hands. He's got it. it you've nailed it there in, in the fact that this summer is actually, to be fair, if we call a spade a spade, every summer for the last ten years we've said this summer is the one. But yeah. like 
for Tin Hag's own career as Man United manager, this summer is is massive for him because he's either going to create a squad that he can trust and that he can build on and that will play the progressive style of football he wants to, or he's going to sign his own debt warrant long term when we look back because this all goes tits up in two or three years. You can look back at this summer and go, this was probably the summer where he needed to make the right decisions. So he's got a lot of um, got a lot of pressure on him this summer with the issue of the ownership, of course, in the background. So we still don't know what's going to happen with that, um, which is probably worrying for him as well because financial backing, what's the transfer kitty, what kind of transfers are they going to sanction, who's going to be sanctioning them. There's a million things up in the air, which is very, very much detrimental for our cause going forward at the moment. Um, but one of the things that's hurting us and has been hurting us so long, is, is Wood, Ed Woodward's legacy is still there. We still have an abundance of players. If you go down the list of the squad and you look at players that we deem, everyone has a, an opinion on everybody else, but if you look at the players we deem not good enough for United to go forward, most of them are still on Ed Woodward-sanctioned massive contracts. contracts. Yeah. Can't fucking get rid of them because they've, they're all signed on to these huge contracts. No one's going to want them. They haven't worked out. And the contracts are so large that it's impossible to shift them, which... Has, Excuse me, which has been causing us massive trouble for years. If if he doesn't get it right this summer, I think he'll suffer long term. Um, the, the the amount of fixtures we've had this year and the amount of congestion. Now, given it's a crazy crazy season with a World Cup in the middle of it and the Queen passing away caused some more fixture upheaval. This season was particularly crazy in um in the scheduling, but. It's exposed massively the, the, the lack of squad depth we have and the lack of quality we have coming through. So I think he know I think he knows himself. Look, I I don't have to tell Eric Ten Hag what to do, but I think he'll be quite well aware that what we have in the background isn't good enough. He needs to bring in more. Even if he's bringing in, if he's not bringing in like these massive superstar footballers, if he's just raising the level of what's coming behind what we have, even I would be quite, pretty happy with that because you drop off a midfield of Bruno Casemiro Eriksson and you come up with. Sabitz or Fred and McTominay. I mean, it's chalk and cheese. There's oh, no geez, yeah. you like put the three of them against the three of them. They'd be it'd be so one sided. It'd be unfair. So we just need to to try and allow us to have these suspensions and have these injuries without changing it into a completely different side. It's like the likes of Bruno against Sevilla the last night. Bruno being out with that side. You look. You can love Bruno or hate Bruno, but you cannot argue the fact that Bruno Fernandez is not absolutely pivotal to our Manchester United side. He is literally of prime importance and you can see the team how it plays without him I know he's a whinger and it pisses me off to watch him sometimes I know he's moaning and he's fucking got, picking up silly yellow he's the only one who right? does it though I think that's the, the, the crucial thing about Fernandez. for a long time before he came to his football club we lacked a lot of personality in the team I yeah. think he shows it now look there's times yeah look there's times where he might be a bit petulant but even still how many of our players go over to the referee and actually try to get something like United in their days when we were winning everything, Brian, we we did manipulate the dark arts. We did, of course. And there's no, there's there's no way to like of you know kind of moving around that. We did. Um, Bruno does it. Look, it's not to everyone's taste. You see certain. Um, I'm not going to name these certain people on on social media. We all know who they are. They love to jump on a Twitter space, um, and they often slag off Bruno Fernandez. Um, you know, day and night. Allegedly, they're United fans, by the way, but. Like when when you see his impact on the team, how he presses from the front, to you know, how he do you know, knits knits together, um, the play. Like Bruno Fernandez is a brilliant, brilliant footballer, and look where he where he lacks discipline sometimes, he makes up for that in quality. I think look like you hit the nail on the head when we see him come out of the team against Sevilla, the 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 lack of drive and communication and and like character in that midfield really did show. Yeah, yeah. The, pa- the passing range was pretty much disappeared. He's a bit of creativity. I know you've got Ericsson in there, but like Bruno's pulling strings from the back. He just, he's just a massively important player. And to lose someone like that, and you're bringing in players that haven't got anywhere near that level of talent, it, it's a massive, it's a massive drop off. It's costing us something serious the last month or two towards the business end of the season. We've been suffering. Casemiro has been picking up a few unnecessary red cards. Um, Another silly yellow card last night, kicking out with a fellow running past him, which wasn't really necessary whatsoever. Um, which I think, I think leads to a suspension for the next European game. Potentially would have been the, the semi-finals. Um, yeah, like we're losing players. You're going to lose players to injury. We've been unlucky. We've lost quite a few key players. 
And again, we keep repeating the same thing. We need squad depth. We need squad depth, yeah. Yeah, look, there's a massive summer ahead of us. I do, do think, like, look, if you get the likes of, so let's say players with big wages, the Donny van de Beeks, the Maguires, Martial's, players like that off the books next season, you're talking a good nearly seven, 700 grand worth of talent off the off the books and you, you factor in your do your tunes ABs, you know, potentially a few loan deals going out in the summer that we can maybe make a, a room for a job, but I suppose quality in that depth and players who suit the system. Yeah, um, if, you, if you can shift off, I mean, Axel Tunes AB is not going to get anywhere near that side. So, like for his own career, he, sh- he doesn't really need to, he doesn't really need to be staying at Man United unless he's on massive money and he's just taking, taking the wage, but Tunes AB can go. Brandon Williams, again, is he ever going to break in to the first team and be a first team regular? I can't see it. Do you know, get the likes of those boys who are on the periphery and really have no real chance of pushing for a first team place. Get them off the books. Get them off to, to a new club. Let them have a, a first team football and bring a couple of players in for the money you get, you know? Yeah, and then look, again, that, that helps balance the books of FFP. And then, like, look, let's say, for example, then, I was saying devil's advocate here, obviously, um, let's say Qatar come in who have extra amount of funds to come in to maybe put into the transfer kitty that would maybe then allow for that you know if we do sell um a couple of players you know i think look there's it's going to be a big summer regardless like you, we, look we're going to touch on obviously the protests led by 1958 i suppose later on towards the, towards the end but i think it's crucial like there's so many things from top to bottom that needs to be sorted and the, this, this summer is definitely one of them yeah i want to touch on i've, I've seen you talk about it like, during the last kind of couple of weeks, Brian, about Jaden Sancho. Um, it's I suppose he's had kind of a stop start um I suppose period in in his career at United. He has shown kind of small bits of promise, but for large parts he's obviously he's had illnesses. He's he has obviously had time off with his mental health issues. And then obviously he's he's come back into the side. He's you know he, he seems to be very strug- he's struggling, you know, quite a bit um in the side. What you make of the performances and do you think it is I suppose similar to kind of Maguire is a is it a confidence thing because like we we seen the Sancho before he came to Manchester United he was a brilliant player in the Champions League for Dortmund played very well in the Bundesliga and the fact he's English you'd like to think maybe he, he he's played in England before that he maybe might be used to the English game though as opposed to maybe like a Kagawa who came from Dortmund you know, who wasn't used to the English game like what, what what do you think is going on with Sancho and do, like do you know are, are you concerned by I suppose his performances as as of late. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, he concerns me. He concerns me in the fact that I don't know. Has he shown enough that he can turn it around? I mean, has there been really that much glimpses of absolute world class talent? Just generational baller, as people were calling him before he came. I don't think I've seen. Um, I don't think I've seen enough from. Him. It's one of those ones where you're. You're torn. Do you want to see Ten Hag make a statement of rootlessness and say, right, you came in for big money, you haven't performed, you're gone. And lay it on a marker for everyone else coming after him. I don't I don't I don't think he's good enough, no. I don't think he's good enough, let's be honest. Um it might be a bit harsh, it might be a bit early to say it. The last night, again I watched him from the sideline or from, from the stands. I was watching him and I'm like, Do you ever break a sweat? Like he was so, so lazy. He was letting fellas run back. <clears throat> he was letting fellas, their right back, sprint past them on attacks. And he was jogging. He didn't follow back half the attacks that came on his side. Going forward, he just looked, he looked devoid of any, any creative ideas. He just got it and he stopped, p- passed it off. Do you know, in, in comparison to Anthony on the other side, like Anthony has had some haphazard games as well. But the one thing you can give Anthony credit for, he'll put in a shift. Like he'll work his arse off up and down the line. How many times was he back in that right back position, fighting yeah. for and, and winding up their players by by getting involved in it and getting in between it? But like Sancho doesn't give you that, you know. And he's not, if you're not going to give enough cover back, you have to be producing going forward. And he's not. He's not giving us as anything going forward. He's not giving us cover for left back. You look at the change last night, like Dallo and Dallo and Sancho on the left hand side versus a, a Shaw and Rashford combination. Sean yeah. Rashford on the left can be absolutely devastating. When they're on form and when they're, when they're playing well, they can rip teams apart on the left-hand side. And in fairness to Shaw, he bombs up and down that line. He gets involved. He's, he's very aggressive to go forward. Very good on the ball as well. Very underrated on the ball, I think. 
good, good passing range, quick, he quick thinking too. You know, he's good. They, he links up well with Rashford, and Rashford will work back. But like again, we're talking about drop off. The drop off from Rashford and and Shaw to, to Dallo and Sancho was huge. The effort, the energy, the ideas, the creativity, very, very, very bad, very, very poor. So Jaden Sancho bothers me. I don't think I've seen enough for him to warrant the reputation that he may have. Um, it's one of those ones, do you hold on for hope? Are you stuck with him because of what you paid for him and the, and the contract he's on? Or do you pull the trigger early doors, get rid and replace? I'd be the latter. Do you maybe look at how Rashford struggled last year? Because we know Rashford really had a big, massive drop-off last season. And do you look at maybe how Rashford went off to, remember he went off to America last summer, really kind of rebuilt his, he locked himself away from all the, yeah. There. Yeah, Am yeah. I back? Are you back? You're back. Go on. I'm back. Yeah, my connection just went there. Sorry. Um, I was just saying, Brian. Like, do you think um the way Rashford went away after struggling last season, he went away to America and kind of rebuilt himself. Do you think Sancho needs to kind of do the same in the summer? Let's say hypothetically speaking, he stays in the summer and Eric Ten Hag gives him one last chance. Do you think he kind of needs to do what Rashford done? Lock himself away, get him away from the distractions, and kind of, I suppose. Re- do do a kind of a rebuilding process, kind of like what he did last summer. But that's you just nailed it. He's already done it. He's already disappeared. He's already gone off yeah. the gone off the, the the radar. He's gone away and been handled with cotton wool, which he obviously needed. Look, I mean, if it was a mental health issue, a hundred percent, I'm behind anybody who wants to get yeah. their started out. And I wouldn't give out to the man for doing so, or I wouldn't knock him for it. But he's been away. He's done that. He and the manager have felt that he's got over that hurdle or got over that mental health issue that he had. So if he declares himself fully fit, the manager reckons he's fully fit, and this is what he's offering us, it's not good enough. Yeah. And look, to be fair, if I look at the options we do have on, let's say, the left-hand side, I think Garnacho this season has showed more in an attacking sense than, than Sancho in terms of taking on a player, you know, working back, working forward, and beating a man. You know, I think that's something that Sancho has lacked. And I think when you look at Garnacho doing it, Rashford doing it, that suits our style of play. Um, on that left-hand side. And also you have to take into consideration as well, Ama Diallo is playing very well um, in the championship at the moment. And he's going to ha- he's gonna want to try to get into the side as well. Facundo Palestri is there. Talks to him going on loan. Um, you know, I think Jaden Sancho has a lot of competition. I think Ericsson Hag does have a big decision to make. It's kind of is a sticker, stick and twist um, at this moment in time. Um, look, I, I do think it's, it's a difficult one because I look at how Rashford, you know, had that difficult year and he came back and had good form. That's why I'd be kind of hesitant to do get let him go. But at the same time, if I look at other players who are there who are progressive, I can see how they suit your our system more. It's kind of a catch twenty two. The th- the thing I suppose I'm probably being harsh in saying get rid of him now, but I'm basing it solely on the fact that Rashford's ahead of him. Garnacho, albeit he's very young, has sh- as you said, he's shown he's shown massive, massive promise. I mean he's shown more to us then Sancho has, and Sancho's meant to be the number, the, the starting player, and Garnacho's meant to be the kid coming through. So, purely on a football reason, we have, we already have a left winger or left sided forward or whatever they want to call it these days in Rashford. We've got Garnacho as to deputise. You have a couple of others floating about. Do you really need Sancho if he's not going to be up to it? Do you really need to hang on and, and hope he comes around, or do you just get rid and put the put the finances into somewhere else that we need it? Do you agree with this comment? Because a comment come in there saying Sancho was the latest version of Jesse Lingard. Would you kind of compare their scenarios? No, Jesse Lingard was a dickhead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we know you're not fond of Jesse. Um, but um, yeah, look, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. I, I do just like, I always have that hesitancy to kind of not write a player off. But like when I look at other players, it's kind of hard not to, hard not to write them off, you know, because when you look at, like you mentioned, Garnacho, Rashford and, the way like Rashford, like last season he had one bad season. You look at Rashford's numbers; they've got mm. better every single season, you know. Um, and he showed versatility as well. So it it, it it's, di- it's a difficult one for Jaden. But I dare to say this won't be the last time this will be discussed on a podcast by anyone, uh, any like United outlet. Um, just to go yeah. back to that comment because I I kind of brushed it off a bit too, uh, too quick. To answer his question about being the the, the new Lingard, Lingard. As much as he frustrated me and as much as he absolutely wound me up beyond belief with his antics off the pitch and his 
silly little celebrations. Like I can accept celebrations like that and all this behaviour if you're winning titles and you're producing the goods every single week in, week out. But Lingard, Lingard was a talented boy, in fairness to him. He had talent. He didn't show it as much as he probably wanted to see it, but he was still a half-decent footballer. Um, he had some great games for us. He just... He oh, was scoring Wembley, weren't he, for us, for a while. He scoring big goals for us. Lovely little volley there in, in the final one year. But yeah. no, I wouldn't say they're, they're the same because Sancho hasn't really been acting a, acting a muppet like Lingard has been doing. Um, like, effect-wise on the team, like, Lingard was detrimental to that side. Like, he was bringing all this... TikTok bullshit into it and himself and Pogba and a few more of them were getting into this little thing about all the, the social media and the haircuts and the celebrations and all that crack that goes with it. Sancho hasn't really done that. I, I, I don't, I don't have, I haven't noticed him involved in much of that kind of behaviour. Seems like a half decent lad. I'm just, it's not that I don't like him as a person uh, where, as I thought, Lingard was a dickhead. I just don't think Sancho is the right player for us. Yeah. And look again, it's like, it's like this, he, he like Sancho could, could probably go to a different side and a different system and play well. It's just again, there's many big players have come to United and who have been great everywhere else, but when they come to United, it doesn't work out. And like, look, it just happens. Like look, once like I always say this: look at one Sebastian Veron. Everywhere yeah. else, he is a brilliant, outstanding footballer. Comes to United and he was a shadow of himself. With the club war on him. I'm, what a baller! My God, he was like yeah. he was a, when I was a young lad. He was a joy to watch. But we've had that. You mentioned another one off, off Dortmund years ago, Kagawa. Lovely yeah. football came to us, didn't work out. It's not against the player. Some people, some people are suited to certain leagues. Maybe Sancho is suited to the German league. Maybe he's not suited to the Premier League. Who knows? It's not. It's no slight on the person. It's, some people can't can't hack it in the Premiership, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Robbie says, "Really glad you stepped in for uh, uh, on, on Thursday." Yeah, look. I was like a dog all day, but then when I got to the game, I was like, you know, what? I'm glad I'm not there. But at the same time, I said I'm going to make up for it tomorrow anyway. Like, look, I've I have a four alarm set, and I'm also getting up for the box at four o'clock in the morning for a Davis Garcia fight. So, um, look, I'll I'll be I'll be in Shannon Airport drinking pints of brain in the morning. Don't worry, um, I'll be there. But, um, yeah, like, look, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And look, there's a lot of players' futures up for debate in the in the next next couple of months. But Obviously, we, we, we talked about the start of the show about last Thursday and a couple of injuries we got. Obviously, two biggest ones are Rafael Varane and, and Lisandro Martinez, who have been, I suppose, instrumental in, in Eric Ten Hag's, I suppose, revival of United. Um, we've seen Lindelof Maguire struggle um, in, in Seville. Obviously, Maguire is suspended for tomorrow. Um, when you look at Victor Lindelof, um, obviously, he's going to start tomorrow. I think that's kind of a cert that he's going to start tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Who do you think should partner him tomorrow? We've seen Casemiro deputise as centre half this season, and he did quite well there in the couple of games he's played there. But also Luke Shaw has also done very well. Phil Jones, unfortunately, is still injured, and can't come in, so we don't have another kind of centre half there. When you look at kind of Brighton's, um, I suppose skill set, like they've they likes of Mithoma, um, Alexis McAllister, Evan Ferguson is fifty fifty playing tomorrow. Um, Danny Welbeck, obviously, um. When you, when you see the way the Serbia has Brighton set up, the way he has Brighton set up, um, who would you prefer to partner Lindelof tomorrow, all things considered? I'm after getting a shiver on my spine when you mentioned Danny Welbeck. Jesus, above. Why is it so many years later and I'm still worried about him sticking on the back of the net against us? Um, I'm probably going to go... I, I wrote down my team earlier for who I predicted or what I think he's going to go with. A lot of it names itself, but the back line, one bissaka right back, I didn't think that I was up to much last night. I was shocked when Basaka went off before him. Um, mm. Lindelof, obviously, in the middle. And Lindelof, before I continue, Lindelof is a player that I'd actually keep next season because depending what we do in the transfer market, Bailly gone, Sir Philip Anthony Jones probably gone, uh, Harry Maguire most likely gone. So you're going to be left with Varane, Martinez, Lindelof's not a bad deputy to pull in here and there if you need him, do you know? I'd prefer if we signed someone, but anyway, continue on. Um, I'd stick Luke Shaw on beside him. Um, and I'd put I'd put Malassia left back. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, like, look, when I look at the, the way you, Ten Hag would want us to play, I think, like, we've seen when he put Luke Shaw on a centre-back, like, it, we don't see 
a terrible drop off on that left hand side in terms of playing out from the back. Like I think, look, if you play Casemiro there, you kind of lose his steel in midfield. Um, I'd agree. I think that'd be that'd be my back four. Um, tomorrow. Um, now I I won't mind whichever one starts at left back, whether it's Dallow or Malasia. I don't mind which one of them starts. Probably in build up, Dallow will probably be better on the ball than Malasia. But I think defensively on the left hand side, <coughs> Malasia is probably a bit more solid. So there's kind of pros and cons with either one we start at left back but I just you know, the left back left back do you know rather than shoehorn and like that was essentially a right back yeah give, give him last year the game I know he hasn't hasn't set the world on fire I've still had a couple of good games so I, I'd give him the nod yeah yeah look it, it, hopefully look, he can redeem, if last year's playing he can redeem himself from that second half against Seville because there was a couple of times he got caught and that what's was. his name Campos um, you roast him so yeah. hopefully, look, hopefully he can redeem himself. Look, he, he's had a good few good, good games this season, so hopefully he can he can do well. You mentioned you had a team row out there, Brian, so I'm actually going to get your team off. You know, I, I know, look, the goalkeeper probably have David De Gea and not less. Have you went to Ventress and through Butland or Heaton in there, have you? Or? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Ten Hag's going to wheel the axe and chop the gear from the side, even though, to be honest, if you ask me, Thursday night after full time I probably would have yeah but um, Dave saves in, in goals um, Wambasaka Lindelof Shaw Malassia Casemiro Eriksson Bruno as our middle three Rashford left Anthony right and against my better judgement because we're absolutely stuck <laughs> the nightmare of my season up front <laughs> oh, what was the podcast her uh uh, titled back in January on Stretty Castle was very, very course um, is on fire your defence is terrified or something something like that D- uh, D- in my defence I did state that I was terrified at the time yeah look you're right you're right now in hindsight you're right um, but yeah like look he, I like his work rate I like his application right I'm, don't get me wrong I like his application but it's, like, you can see the lack of quality there um, like you know there's a reason why he scored two goals at Burnley Um that season who goes United this season in his in yeah. every bed. He look, he could it depends on what Tin Hag wants to do. Tin Hag seems to like the fella, he likes the way he links up play up front, likes the way he brings other players into it. I can appreciate that if he scored if he chipped in with a few goals here and there, he doesn't, so he, he winds me up. He could potentially play Rashford up front and stick with Sancho left, maybe or something like that. Um but I don't think he will. I think he'll go with Vegas up top. Yeah. I'd like same Thursday, I'd like to see Pellistry get more of a goal. Mm. I like the look of him. Like I think, I think he offers more than Alanga does. Alanga seems to have been a bit of a flash in the pan as such. He just hasn't built in it whatsoever. So Johnny came on, bo- on board first, looked half decent, went away in the summer, hit the gym, got ripped. Looked like he's after building his strength to really work down that side, but hasn't followed through. Um, I like Pellistri. I'd like to see what he's able to do. I'm back. I just my whole screen just went haywire there. What were you saying, Brian? Sorry. I was just saying that the link to the GoFundMe to sponsor new Wi Fi for Keen is at GoFundMe forward slash Keen's Wi Fi is shit. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The, get, no. get, the link is in the video description, lads. <laughs> I'd like to see more of Pellistry, was basically what I was getting at. Yeah, like, look, he's. Um, yeah, look, he's, he's done well. He's a good close control. Um, like, look, he's. He's definitely, he's definitely, I think, a better asset than Alanga. I think he's probably he has more to his game. I think Alanga, look, a big thing with him last year is he got massively exposed by playing too much under Rangnick. I think Rangnick overplayed him mm-hmm. um, last season. And look, I think a lot of his flaws did get exposed. Um, someone said, it's what Harry Maguire came, cut my Wi Fi wires yet. Probably did to be fair. Um, my Wi Fi was just as slow as Harry Maguire there. Um, but yeah, like, look, he. I think with Lange, he definitely needs a loan move um, next season, just to see if he's even... I, I'd probably loan him to a Premier League club next season. Um, I wouldn't go as low as a championship, because I do think we, you can kind of could get a false stone if you loan, loan him there. I think you'd need to loan a Lange to a lower Premier League team to see if, he, if he's able to play in the Prem. And if he has a good showing, you can sell him for a fee. And plus, he's an academy player. If you're talking about ballots in the books, you can sell him for a good fee then, and yeah. it'd be good that way. But yeah, look, I don't think he has much for the future. But in terms of Palestri, I'd like to see him definitely get um, a few more games. Hopefully, if we can get top four wrapped up in the next few weeks, as much as an, of an ask that could, could end up potentially being um, results dependent, 
I'd like to see Plestri get a couple of games um, towards the back end. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That's the, that's that's probably the aim. I'd imagine at this stage, try to get top four confirmed, and then give a few lads a couple of games and rest a few more lads that have been played like dogs for the season. Um, tomorrow, like I wouldn't be suggesting tomorrow's the day for Plestri, but he's a player. He's a player. I was unsure of, and the few brief times I've seen him play, he looks like he's got something about him. So. Um, he starts year boy as well. Like we're actually a decent team, like as yeah. well, like nationally. So he definitely must have something about him. You look at the attackers they have as well. You you said something there about Anthony Langa about loaning him out to a lower Premiership side as opposed to going to the Championship. That's my worry about Ahmed Diallo. Whereas Diallo's in the Championship doing well, is he able to make the step up to the Premiership? Um, looks looks like a very very tidy player in the Championship. Concerns me a little bit if he can make it. If he can make the jump up, I mean, the jump from the championship up to top four, top six is monstrous. Yeah, one to watch for definite. But again, where, like again, where does he where does he fit into the side based on what we have at the moment and what we potentially could have afterwards? Where does Diallo come into it? The good thing about Diallo is he's very flexible in terms of his position. He can play behind the striker, he can play on the right, he can play on the left, um, and even play as a false nine. Let's say if we go like with that, so I think he can definitely he can he can fit all them positions. I think if you're looking at the style of play we play on that right hand side if we get an Anthony injury like we did this season we won't have to play Rashford on the right if Diallo is there you know and we know how like how Rashford's game changes when he goes over to that right hand side so I definitely bring him back next year um, especially like when you look at the reports that, like, that have been consistent the last couple of months that Plester is going to be loaned out next season then I definitely bring him back especially if Sancho is still struggling you know I think just to have him there, I think, like, look, if he, if he can't come in and deputise next season or even push next season, then then you kind of look at him and probably get rid. But I definitely, um, I definitely will keep him. Julio has made a comment there about, um, about Diallo. He said, Championship is arguably the most difficult league to make, and you'd be surprised. I'm not worried about him at Diallo. He'll, he'll come in for as depth as number 10 or the wing. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he looks at that. He can, he can play in both positions. Um, and Kieran is saying that uh, you're driving them mad with the pen there, Brian, as well. Uh, but <laughs> he has the pen out there. He's like he's, he's like Jose Mourinho at the notebook back in the day. Um, but Sorry. yeah, like look for you. <laughs> um, it could be interesting to see how he's how Ten Hag uses him, and um, the fact that he can play in a multitude of positions. Um, you know. Um, it, it would be good. Someone's just thrown in a comment. Um, yeah, I, don't, I think yeah they said that you should get guests on the show that go to matches <laughs> on the moonlight. It's not this day trip and red guy. <laughs> this is definitely this is definitely someone taking the piss at Noah's Brian. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, just just to retort to that, James. Some of us were in the bill and some of us pulled out. And I'll see you in the morning in Kilburn and have the egg bombs ready. Yeah, get get the round in tomorrow. Um. Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's fun me there now. Um, and Kieran says cheers for the show as well. Love the show. Um, on that, we've mentioned obviously match going fans, and this kind of throws me to a nice segue before I get your score prediction um, for tomorrow, Brian. Obviously, nineteen fifty eight have um, they're, they're organising another protest for the Aston Villa game. <laughs> um, obviously, that this whole sale with the, I suppose this proposed sale with the Glazers looks like they're. They're trying to force their hand to get partial investment in rather than make a full sale. It's kind of looking like it looks like, you know, obviously 1958 done a lot of great work in terms of you know, getting fans together. Fan protests have been very consistent since last year, since the 1958 group formed. Obviously, you're a chairman of a Manchester United supporters club yourself. Um, when you look at how the 1958 are supposed to are getting fans together, making movements towards, I suppose, getting the owners out. And um, what, first of all, what do you think of kind of what they do and also you yourself as being a, I suppose, a chairman of supporters club, Brian, um, do you know, have you had any communication from them and kind of, do you know, what are your whole overall thoughts on it? Um, absolutely. And a hundred percent supportive. I have done since the start, have attended multiple protests, marches, staying outside, et cetera, et cetera. Um, fantastic to see someone, a group take the lead in this with sustained pressure. And what, a lot, of, a lot of people at the start thought it's a fly-by-night group of people that's going to do fuck all. It's going to be one protest and it'll all fizzle off. Like that empty old Trafford hashtag bullshit that went on there last year or this year, whenever it was. But no, they, like they've they've stayed the course. It's been level-headed, measured. They've been consistent. Um, 
they've maintained what I think is the right the right level of of protest without pushing it too far and turning it into something it shouldn't be for now. Um, and I suppose on the legality side that is, albeit the ESL protest, which broke which broke rules and broke laws, probably achieved a lot more visually and impact wise. It's hard to ask people to do that. You can't. It's very very difficult to ask them. Yeah. We saw plenty of reds in court after that. So do you know, it is what it is. But the way they're going is probably the right way to go. They've been impressive with the level of protest and the consistency of protest. If you're going to, it's something I've, I've, I've discussed with lads. If you're going to the match, why would you not go to the protest? Is the question I would ask someone. If you're going to be going to the match on that day, what reason, barring you just want to stay in the pub and get pissed, which we do for most games regardless, what reason would you have not to go to the protest? Can you really hold your head up and slag off the Glazers and say you want them out and they're, they're this and they're that and fucking hate them? But yet there's a protest in the same city that you're in on the same day and you can't be asked to walk down the road with like-minded fans and make a bit of noise. Um, I like what they do. I appreciate the fact that they do it. Um, I would hope that they get the support they need and they deserve when they're organising these things. Um, like anything, they're not all, they're, they probably won't always get everything right. No one ever does. But they seem to have got more right than they've got wrong for definite. And... Anything that they might consider themselves that they didn't get, they did, that didn't work out, they've probably learned from it and, and, and grown and, and and evolved as time went on. So no, they're 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 a great group to have. They're a great asset to the fan base, the match go on Reds especially. Um, although to be fair to them, they've they've been inclusive of non match going Reds as much as they have match going Reds. They've they've made a real effort to push the message out and get the people like that involved, people like who were overseas and can attend games. They've tried to get them involved with email barrages of, of sponsors and and the owners and that kind of thing. So they've you know, they've been creative, trying to be inclusive. Um, they've been they've been they've been doing their part as best they can, and it's it's better to have them than not to have them. So fair play to them, and I hope it continues. Yeah, definitely. And look, it's something I'm 100 percent behind as well. And look what they've done, and they've been consistent about it. And I think they've gone about the thing the right way because I don't like you. I think you touched on. It's very much impossible to do a protest every week like the European Super League. Um, and look, that was an anomaly, I think, in terms of the fans just had enough and the fact it was in lockdown. There was, there was, look, you can, you can talk about there's many different factors what happened that specific day. Um, and look, It was a perfect storm of, 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 yeah. of people generally being pissed off at life, of the idea of football being changed to that level and being stolen away from us. And just general rest of lockdown and whatnot and, and and obviously the passion of your own football club i mean yeah. i think i think being possibly being a, t- a tad arrogant we showed up a few other clubs our fan base showed other clubs how it should and could have been reacted to we pushed the boat out that bit further than everybody else did and the the reaction from the media and the reaction itself overall was unbelievable so um it was a credit to our fans who were involved in the day yeah 100 percent. and look there's Many more protests coming, including the one that's on um, on the 30th this month um, for the Aston Villa game. And for fans who are watching this, who are match intending fans, or fans who even who are, are overseas, I, do, I know we a lot of overseas listen, listeners as well. So whatever part of the world you're from, do drop down the video link description. Um, the link is there for the 1958 um, Twitter page. All the details to the protest there, make sure you like the tweet, share the tweet, post into all the groups you are involved in. Um, and look, we'll be doing the exact same here. On the podcast, we're going to be promoting every single 1958 protest and online campaign or anything they have. So, look, 100%. Like this channel is fully behind what they do and whatever plans they have going forward. Um, and I know obviously the lads straight news are the same. And look, we're as a fan base, regardless of what connection you have to the club, I think everyone should be should be behind it. I know there's other outlets out there who haven't been behind it, and that's their choice. But if you're a Manchester United fan, you want the best for Manchester United. I do suggest that that you do support a group like this. Um. But we have a couple before I get your score prediction, Brian. There's a couple of questions here for you in particular, and um, from a couple of our listeners. So I'll just get these for you, for, for you before we end this podcast. Um, first one is in from Reese, and um, he says, "Brian, what's been um, our best performance this season, in your opinion?" I thought Barcelona away was unbelievable. Um, it was a game I went into expecting the worst. 
and came out of it thinking we'll probably left it behind us, which which may not fit the whole best performance of the season. But I thought we were that good that we gave a team on a stature as Barcelona a, such a good game, a game we could have beat them and we got. I just thought we played over skins. It was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that was a brilliant performance at New Camp. Look, and you look at their run of form. They, were, they smashed Madrid. They bet Madrid twice um, in that run of form. They're unbeaten for months in that. And unbeaten at home in Europe for, for a good while there in that run as well. So, yeah, I agree. That was one of our, I suppose you were talking about, most impressive performance. I think that that performance probably was. Or the one at Old Trafford, whichever one you kind of want to talk about. I think for me, if I had to give my answer to this, I think if you're, look, if you're talking a full 90-minute performance under Eric Van Hag, I say Spurs at home. Because we really we battered them that day, we really controlled the game for all the game, and we literally didn't give them a sniff. And it was probably the most complete performance we've had this season in terms of a consistent ninety minutes. Um, that's probably the one I'd give. Um, if I was giving my two cents on it, um, Kieran asked, um, Brian, what's the best game you've been to and why? Assuming it's this season, um, I would say. Again, a toss-up between Leeds away and Barca away based on the fact that Leeds away is a special fixture due to the rivalry. The fact they have, they've been disappeared for how many years they've gone? 15, 16, 17 years. So nice to have that game back in our, in our Arsenal again every season. Well, sorry, every season up to this season because it's looking like they're going to go back to shit again and go down. But Leeds away was fantastic. There's, um, there's, a, real, there's a real vicious hatred between both sets of fans the atmosphere is unbelievable um, and we, we usually give them a stuff and so that was fantastic and again Barca away didn't I went over expecting it to be expecting it to be not a great away end because you're up in the gods and not expecting much from the game thought the away end was very very good in the night the game was brilliant um, probably two of my favourite games yeah yeah definitely if I talk about my favourite game I was at this season probably the derby I'd say the derby the fact that like they went one all up Grealish taught um, Grealish thought he won it and um, he thought he was that guy and then you know, when, when Rashford scored that winner that, I know Old Trafford's falling apart right? but I thought Old Trafford was fucking genuinely going to fucking collapse yeah. like, the atmosphere, like, the, like the whole ground was fucking shaking and yeah it, was just, it felt good it felt like we had our club back at that point in terms of like real quality and like you know, winning a big game um, it kind of made me feel similar to when McTominay scored that um, halfway, line goal, halfway line goal a couple of years ago um, it was kind of similar kind of moment had a few brilliant games and a brilliant nights under Ten Hag so far, haven't we? We've had some really, really good performances that will really put the put the passion back in you, like the Leeds, Barca, Spurs, like the City. It's really, really top nights. Yeah, and, and yeah, I know. And look, it's the I think it's the, he's getting us to believe again. And, and Gagan is saying get 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 the badge in as well. Um, right. In tomorrow, Gagan, Gagan. Well, actually, sorry, it's Gagan. I had to I had to figure this out with him one day. James it's Gagan. Is it? James James Hallis, our earlier jester, um, refers to him as Gagan, but it's Gagan, yeah. Hello, Gagan. See you tomorrow also. <laughs> um, yeah, like, look, it's, yeah. I'm going to have to get that pronunciation right. Um, I, I do apologise for anyone who, I, if I do, if you're in the comments and I butcher your name, please let me know, because I, like, I, I drive myself mad when I do that. But yeah, look, there's been many performances under Ten Hag that have been good, and look, hopefully there's more to come next season. Um, but we're going to wrap it up there, Brian, but before I leave you go... Um, Give me your score prediction for tomorrow. Do you think we're going through to the final and I suppose setting up a date with our with our noisy neighbours? Um Jesus, oh, even the thoughts. The thoughts of what they could possibly achieve is is, is another podcast in itself. But um let's be optimistic. I'll go two on United. Um with a sneaky one they'll win in the final, by the way. Um Rashford and Bruno no, yeah, Rashford and Bruno. Go on. I thought you were going to say Phil Vekhorst there for a second, Brian. I thought you thought you were going to be overly optimistic there. No, I was going to go Anthony Vekhorst, you mad? Anthony. <laughs> no, 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 no. If, if, here, look, I'm telling you, I know you have to catch a flight after the game tomorrow, but I'm telling you, Phil Vekhorst sto- scores, and um, we're getting your own Jager bombs in before you go home. Um, either to, you know, to find some after the game, um, if Phil Vekhorst scores a goal. But on that, guys, and um, thanks very much, everyone tuning in live and who will tune in on the replay later. Don't forget to um, like the video, obviously share uh, on Twitter and stuff like that. And um, yeah, look, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do a review of the game as always. And look, we will be back um, next Tuesday. Speaking of the 1958, we will have a member of the 1958 on with us um, on Tuesday. And um, we'll be talking about the protests and also 
about what they what they're about and what they do. And Lee Lawrence and Phil Mar for Manchester United players will be joined us then too. So look, make sure to listen in for that. That will be uploaded um on Tuesday. But thanks very much for Brian for coming on. I will hopefully four, four alarms set for the morning. I will definitely see you in the morning. Don't um, miss. Shannon Airport. And uh, yeah, look, uh, we'll see you later, guys. <laughs>